It's time once again to slip into your camo, grab your bow, and join us out in the field for another episode of the Up North Journal, presented by PSE Archery. The Up North Journal crew is knocked and ready to rock for another exciting adventure. So let's step outside and hit the trail. Welcome back to another episode of the Up North Journal, everybody. I'm host Mike Adams, sitting in the cabin tonight with Dan DeFall. Before we get started, we want to help you save some money. That's right, folks. Uh, don't forget to use our promo codes to save that money. And let's start off with BuckBaits.com. That's right, the brick-and-mortar store of BuckBaits down at Sterling Heights, Michigan at 15 and Dodge Park. Go over there. If you're on the website, BuckBaits.com, use the promo code UNJ20. That will get you 20% off your order. For those of you who are looking for Easy Cut products, make sure you go to EasyCutProducts.com. And when you're there, use the UNJ promo code UNJ15 off to save 15% off your order. And let's not forget Lincoln Roan over at Packermax.com. It's never too early, never too late to think about the Packermax. Go on over to Packermax.com, use the promo code UNJ25. That'll give you $25 off your order over at Packermax Outdoor. For those of you looking for some new firearms and firearm products, make sure you go over to the islandarmory.com. While you're there shopping, use the promo code UNJ15. J10 to save 10% off your order there. If you shot that bird of a lifetime and you want it mounted, don't forget Troublesome Creek Taxidermy. We've had them live on the show. We've talked to them. Uh, you want to get 10% off your order, go to Facebook, go to troublesome.creek.7, find their website. If you go to our website, UNJ, make sure to click on the button to download the form. You get 10% off over there using the code UNJ10. Looking for that game call, whether it be a squirrel, whether it be goose, duck, deer, make sure you go to J. JPO Game Calls. Look for them at jpogamecalls.com. And while you're there shopping, use the UNJ10 promo code to save 10% off your order. And Miller Deer Tracking, the man that seems to never sleep during deer season, get 20% off your next deer tracking uh, using the promo code UNJ20. Look for Miller Deer Tracking on Facebook or give him a call over at 810-240-4891. Looking for the hottest new plastics to take on the water, whether it be hard water or soft water, make sure you go over to southernindianabaitco.com. While there, use the UNJ promo code UNJ10 to save 10% off your order. Deer Camp Coffee, folks. We drink it every night on the show. You want to try it? You can go to the brick and mortar store at 15 and Dodge Park at Deer Camp itself or go to DeerCampCoffee.com. Also use our promo code UNJ10. You get 10% off your order. And don't forget, get a bag of the UNJ Medium Roast Blend there as well. All right, Danny. Where's our live view camera look from tonight? Good evening, everybody. Live in the cabin. That's right. Up North Journal. It's live. It's Wednesday night. And we are taking a semi-live look. Is that my backyard? <laughs> right? <laughs> um, it could be a lot of backyard. It is 70 degrees here, uh, here in Michigan. But we are looking over Lake Chemung, I do believe is how you pronounce it, in Bridge North, Ontario. We're going across the border tonight. We are. We are. And there's a purpose of why we're going across the border. That's right. But that did look kind of like my backyard. I think I could float a kayak or a canoe in the backyard tonight. I tell you what, besides the, the, the backyard, the streets were, man, it has just been water city. But it's been uh, been nice with 70 degrees. It is nice. You know, it's a little humid, but uh, the weather's changing. I think we're going to start to see leaves on the trees here real soon, and flowers are going to start popping. But uh, I think we just need to go ahead and, and pop right into the show tonight because well, yeah. we're, go we're going across the border. We're going across the border to Ontario, and you met this gentleman at that um, symposium. Symposium. In East Lansing. Lansing. That's yeah. right. Yep. Uh, we got tonight, we've got Kevin Callen, the happy camper from Bridge North, Ontario, correct? Yes. All right. I got it right. Okay. Bridge. Bridge North. I keep wanting to say Bridgeport because we've got a Bridgeport We've got there. a Bridgeport just a couple miles up the road. So, so Kevin, welcome to the show, man. I appreciate you coming on tonight. It's fantastic. Yeah, it was great to see you at the show. The Lansing uh, a Quiet Adventure Symposium where you have canoes and kayaks and uh, on the other side you've got a rabbit <laughs> contest going on. Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. What was, what was next door? A, a, a le legitimate rabbit show? It was a rabbit show, yeah. And it smelled like a rabbit show. Really? Oh, yeah, it was great. It was great. Huge. I remember one year I was uh, going from the airport in uh, the Shola van, and beside me in the Shola van was the rabbit judge from the rabbit show. Ah, right? okay. And so me being a real idiot, I asked him every single question someone should never ask a <laughs> rabbit judge. 
Right? <laughs> I said, well, then it's a floppy ear. Do you put it down? You know, uh, or, you know, do you eat the rabbits after the... the, the, the and he didn't find me funny, but the, the mm. shuttle driver, young kid, he was just laughing his buns. Well, what I would, what I would have asked, I, what I would have asked is, why don't you have this show in the hunting expos next door? Yeah, there you go. Because we could have live target range. You could have rabbit hunting right there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure that would get you done well, right? Yeah. Did he have a rabbit in his hat or up his sleeve? I asked those questions. I asked him <laughs> if he had it in his hat. Um, and again, he he. Actually, in his final answer, he kept quiet for the whole thing. He was very serious, man. He had a tuxedo on. <laughs> and he goes, uh, I go around the world judging rabbits, and I make millions of dollars. What is your plan in life? <laughs> <laughs> to have fun and stay in the outdoors as long as possible. <laughs> That's what I like to do. <laughs> so, Whatever. But, yes, welcome to the show. And we got your book here, uh, your 18th book. Actually, this is your 19th as we discussed. Another bend in the river. How many bends are there to a river? Quite a bit. It all depends how bad your life is or how exciting your life is. Depends how you judge the bend. Okay. If, if there's a white water, if there's a waterfall ahead, or there's just, you know, nice loon calls and mist, and there's trout around the corner, it all depends. There you okay, go. Okay, so, <laughs> uh, as we get into this book and we talk about your life as, as a are you an extreme canoeist, or are you just a canoeist, or what are you? Well, I'm a fanatic, I would say. Ooh, I fanatic. mean, I've been canoeing since I was 12. I, my very first canoe trip, my dad would always take me out uh, fishing. At, um, we'd go camping, or we'd go to those fly-in fishing lodges. And when I was 12, I had that t-shirt on saying, oh, no, it's Mr. Bill. So that just shows you how old I am, right, from Saturday Night Live. There you go. And, that is um, classic. Oh, yeah, it was classy, right? So we, we were out on uh, this remote lake uh, doing lake trail fishing, uh, trailing on, in an aluminum boat, and we weren't doing well. So the, the lodge owner said, well, go to the back lakes, and there's an old canoe. So it was a Grumman canoe, which was probably new at the time, whatever. Now it's a, a, a archaic, whatever. So we went in and uh, the back lakes, and we just, just went nuts on brook trout. And I wrote in my journal, because I'm a writer and I'm a geek, and I said, you know, this vessel is a great vessel to get into brook trout fishing. And that's kind of what got me into canoe uh, uh, tripping. Uh, I, I got fanatic with it because, you know, you know, I, I, I have no problem with, with you getting in with a boat and ATVs, whatever, but the idea of getting in, in, in the back lakes with a canoe is that you're going to get a lot more brook trout and you're going to get less people. And if you actually meet someone out there, they're going to be just like you because they just went through hell just like you did on the portage, right? Right, right. Getting from one place to the other, you know, I kind of equate it uh, by reading your book like uh, the Boundary Waters in Minnesota here, uh, where you can go from lake to lake to lake. I and mean, even here in Michigan and up in the Upper Peninsula, you, you can do the same thing. Uh, there's just there's lakes everywhere. But you, or you, even if it's on a river and you got a place like you're talking about Whitewater, you don't want to go through it. You, you got you, what you call portage. So I, I, I'm going to ask that question, portage, portage. Danny, Danny says portage, and I said, no. I said, I think he says it was, it's portage. <laughs> well, that's a big debate, right? Uh, I'll, 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 I will do, give two answers. One is, if you look at the history of the word, uh -huh. it is a French word. So uh, port, port, portage is not French. Portage is French. Okay. And so, therefore, it's correct. And mind you, I know so many American paddlers, and they say portage. And at the end of the day, I don't really care. It still hurts when you do it. So I don't care how you <laughs> call it. <laughs> at the end of the day, if it's a portage or a portage, you, you're you sore when you're done. Well, it's true. And it's also like what, what the, uh, the battery waters, uh, they measure uh, portages by rods and or yards. But, um, uh, but they also uh, measure it by um, port, um, canoe lengths. Okay. So, so the old way is that it, it, a 16-foot canoe. So, how many uh, of, of lengths of those canoes are? That makes more sense to me than actually measuring in any, any other way, right? I mean, yeah. It, it does. I, I mean, I understand why, but I wouldn't. If you told me it was, you know, 50 canoe lengths or whatever, right. I, I'd like, okay, well, what's the length of the canoe? But I mean, I, you've explained it now, so I'd have to do the math in my head real quick to kind of get a sense of it, but. Yeah, it's uh, the, the language. It, it, it may be a little different, but at the end, it's all the same, right? I, I would love to write a book on canoe culture because I've traveled around a lot. And 
Um, they all grow up for the same reason, but you, if you go to Maine, they pull uh, canoes up rapids. If you go to New Brunswick, they pull canoes. If you actually go to uh, Algonquin, um, uh, you know, in central Ontario, they use prospector canoes with a straight shaft uh, beaver tail paddle. If you go to the Boundary Waters, they use a bench shaft paddle. If you go to actually the, the western uh, Canada or even western United States, they actually use streamlined canoes, not, uh, not symmetrical canoes. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not to say, like... Um, you know, what is right and what is wrong. It's like, as long as you're going. And I got to say, I, I went to, uh, um, the last fall I went to the, the uh, Welsh ca uh, Canoe Symposium in the UK. Mm -hmm. And I go there every, every few years and go to Scotland and, and go to uh, England and go paddling with them. And they are just far more experienced than any American and, and Canadian paddler, like for, for skill set. Because right. they practice all the time. They're very, very knowledgeable, very skilled far more than I, and I've been paddling for years. But what's really interesting is when I was speaking there uh, th this last year, the, the young guy ahead of me, he, he was talking about a river he did where he did not see anybody for 20 minutes. <laughs> 20 minutes. <laughs> 20 minutes. And then I got up on stage, and I'm presenting on this river I did for five weeks up in far northern Ontario where I didn't see anybody for five weeks. Right. I was like, tw and they can't paddle that. They can't paddle right. at all. Wow. Yeah. So it was a different culture, right? So yeah, yeah. you know, it, it is kind of uh, unique to different regions, I guess. Or, you know, there's people we know that that do exclusively lakes, or they do exclusively rivers, or they they only kayak in northern Michigan. They don't kayak in southern Michigan, and and then you get into those discussions about you'd mentioned about different types of canoes. Well, we're into the kayaking, so it's a different type of kayak, whether the, it's the beam width or the length or what type of paddle. It, it, yeah. But we're all going to the same place. Well, even like a anglers are, are doing a lot of uh, sit-on kayaks, which makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, casting as opposed to the kayak, the other kayaks. Um, or even a lot of canoeists don't fish. I mean, I fish. I mean, my dad would actually come down from heaven and, and haunt me for the rest of my life if I went across a northern lake and didn't fish it in a canoe. Yeah. Where other people would do that, and they're like, they wouldn't even bring a fishing rod, which I, to me would be a sin. Right. Um, yeah, it's just different worlds, right? Right, exactly. And and not only did you, your favorite recipe I find in the book is uh, is trout. So you obviously you like trout, and but I see you were a, a good little Catholic boy, but you had three <laughs> sisters. <laughs> How did that work out with you being the youngest? Uh, did do any of them canoe with you? It was hell. It was hell. <laughs> Imagine, uh, uh, okay, so really the funny part is uh, I'm the last male uh, Callan, um, right? And so I, I, so my dad was really excited when I was born, but my three older sisters, they basically called me the prince, right? <laughs> um, and, you know, I, I, I didn't really get away with anything. We were really strict uh, upbringing, and I love my sisters, but it was so funny you have to realize that I'm very hyper uh, it, and I, you guys met me at the Lensi show. I was really hyper. I am the quiet one of the family. My three sisters are 10 times more hyper than I am. So gatherings right? so, are really loud. Oh, can you imagine at Christmas? It, it's <laughs> insane. Absolutely insane. Right. So, and it was funny writing a memoir because when I wrote it, they're like, Oh, are we in it? Yes. It's a memoir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're in it. You're part of the family. Oh yeah. And I, I have to characterize the one, the one sister I'm more close to, she's only two years older than I, so we grew up more together than the others. But I had to characterize when I was in high school, uh, in, in the, in the, in the school play, she was the, the class act of the Wicked Witch of Wizard, Wizard of Oz. I was one of the monkeys. That oh. characterizes my life right there. <laughs> <laughs> wow. It sets the tone. <laughs> it sets the Yeah, that's a nice family dynamic. Oh, man. And now we know why Dad wanted to go fishing, because he needed some quiet time, right? He really did take me away uh, to do all that. I, I even would say that um, you know, my dad was a, a professional boxer, and if you know, look at me physically, that that didn't happen with me. <laughs> you were right, right? But um, but I think one of the nicest stories of my life was that I was a really shy kid. Uh, I was uh, I had very bad speech impediment. I stuttered, um, didn't like people, was really nervous around people. And my dad knew that, so he thought, well, we better get you into something. So he put me into scouts, and I love scouts. I've helped scouts all my life. I've volunteered for them uh, do, to do that. But I just didn't like going there because I didn't like people. And you would love this story, guys. 
especially if you're a tread angler. So my dad would, at 12 years old, he would drop me off at the church to go to scouts to get used to people. And uh, he would drive off. I never went. I, <laughs> I went and got my bamboo fishing rod and a can of worms I st stuck behind the church. And I went trout fishing on some trout stream just down the valley from the, from the church. And when he came to pick me up, he thought I was at the scout meeting. So the story of it, really quick version, is then all of a sudden one day he came home from church, uh, oh, sorry, from from work. He worked at a factory, and he goes, "Yo, know, Kevin, the, the big scout thing is 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 this weekend the scout camp?" Like, "Oh, oh yeah, Dad, I forgot. I didn't forget. I didn't know anything about it." Right. So I started to pack, and halfway through, I I finally had to tell him, like, "Dad, I never went," and I thought he was going to be really mad. And he just looked at me. I just love that moment. He goes, "Well, I guess you better just do more fishing then." There you and go. That's really kind of cool about that whole thing, guys. You can imagine, imagine this, this shy little kid, and then all of a sudden I started presenting, writing books. That five years ago, and this is, I, I can't make this crap up, this story. Five years ago, I was on a huge speaking tour because I had a big book out at the time, and I was really busy, and one of the, the, the places I was going to was some scout camp, some leadership uh, thing, and I didn't know much about it. I was just driving there, and I was going there, and there was over a 1,000 people there, a thousand oh. scout leaders in a field, and they had bagpipe people bagging in, and I was the lead speaker of the motivational speech, and <laughs> it was the camp I was supposed to be at when I was 12! There you go. The guy the guy that skipped uh, going to scout they finally got him there. was the, the lead keynote speaker. Right? Yeah, and to calm down after that, I went trail fishing. There you That's go, awesome. and you know, we do have a question coming in over the chat. Um, are your sisters married, and are they quiet men they're married to? Oh, that's a good question. Uh, they're all married. Uh, I just want to know, my, my uh, that, no, that's not true. Uh, Michelle, that's two uh, years uh, older than me, she was married, and um, no longer. The, the bugger actually messed around on, with the marriage counselor. Anyway, that's another story. Um <laughs> Uh, yeah, he was an ass. But, um, <laughs> right. uh, but no, they're, they're not hyper. Uh, the other two g g gentlemen, uh, they're not hyper. They're tolerant. <laughs> oh, there you go. So, you know, and, and we, we, so there you go, folks. You know, it, you, it must be, holidays must be an interesting time when they all get That's together awesome. and the Callens all have a good time, especially from what I hear if the whiskey gets out, right? <laughs> um, but uh, we need to come up on our first break. But while we go to the first break, where can people get this book, Another Bend in the River? Yeah, so it's everywhere. It's a, a bestseller now, so Amazon, obviously. Uh, but it's also um, um, on uh, any uh, local bookstore can order it. And you guys have, what, Barnes & Nobles? It, mm -hmm. It's there as well. Right. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it's everywhere. Just order it, or you can uh, you can even contact me if you want want me to put my initial on it, and I'll send it to you. There you go. So let's step out. We'll take our first break of the night. All right. We'll be right back after this. All right. Looks like we got some questions coming in. Danny, you can uh, yeah. <laughs> filter them in when uh, wherever that's appropriate. Mark loves so. canoeing. <laughs> when he encounters shallow water, the rocks beneath him cheer him on. Uh huh. Okay. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, you ready for second segment? You got anything? <laughs> yeah, let's go. Okay. All right. Oh well, well just uh, yeah, I got something real quick. Okay. All right. Following his life out of Catholic school, that picture in there of him praying is just about. Okay. That's beautiful. Okay. All right. Sister Alexander, oh my God, what a nightmare. I think Danny went down the same path. Am I right? A little bit. A little bit. Look at that. Right. Look at that. Praying photo. Yep. All right. Here we All go. All right. Stand by. Three, two, and one. Welcome back. Second segment of the show. Sitting here talking with Kevin Callen, the happy camper from Ontario. You know, Kevin, you're our first guest from Canada. Eh? Really? Yes. Oh, I'm very honored. Eh? Hey? <laughs> We're honored to have you on. So, um, Dan, go ahead. You had something you wanted to so, uh, get into. Obviously, uh, my fiancé, your <laughs> girlfriend, are watching the show tonight. Uh, my fiancé says uh, that he would get along with Ron, his brother, her brother. Okay. He's got five sisters, five daughters, and two granddaughters. Wow. Right? Yeah. He's the lone wolf, huh? Yep. 
And then Nancy says, Mike, that's us. She's the hyper and you're the tolerant one. <laughs> uh, I'm going to be tolerant right now. Right? So, you know, <laughs> you, you, ta you talked about in the last break, uh, not going to scouts, learning to love trout fishing. But, dude, you played in a band, a punk band. Y yeah, well, I played in anything that would let me play. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, that band was called Santa Syphilis. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that, but it's a true story. And what happened was we, we were asked, uh, it was actually two female lead singers uh, dressed in full leather and belts around their, their breasts and punked hair. And uh, we, we, were, we were well known in, in school. And then so they, the principal asked us to be at the Christmas assembly because of that. But they, she did not know that we were called Santa Sopha. <laughs> so before we, we went on, we had to change our name to... <laughs> Brand muffins, I think it was. Okay. And, uh, yeah. and, and the two lead singers, they used to chain me up to the drum set like the like the Muppet guy. Oh, uh, animal, like yeah. Drummer. Yeah. 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 Nice. So, yeah. Oh man. What haven't you done? I did a lot of weird stuff because I'm very hyper. Um, I, I can't sit still, and everybody goes, "Well, how did you have that many jobs?" Two reasons. <laughs> One is I couldn't sit still. Uh, and others uh, is I needed everything possible to get me outdoors. Every single job and every single thing I volunteer for and every single thing I did in my life, I needed to get outdoors, uh, whether it was writing, whether it was doing film, whether it was on TV, all these things. And it was like school, and I couldn't sit still and couldn't be indoors because of high anxiety. I was the, I was the iceberg. If, if a lot of, a lot, I think a lot of people out there would, would uh, relate to this as a kid because back in the day, Nobody really talked about high anxiety. I mean, mm -hmm. that you just you were who you were, right? right. And mm -hmm. whether you were bullied or not, whatever, or you were in a punk band, whatever. But I was the iceberg, so nobody really knew what was going on because I was, you know, a nice guy. But underneath, I was just falling apart, like uh, high anxiety, like uh, to the point that back in those days, I mean, now we do meds and, and, and we see counselors for it. But there was a one point where I was a preteen, and they said, well, if you go in the bush. You so high anxiety that your your heart muscles are having problems right now. So you basically have these mini heart attacks. Wow. And they're not really heart attacks, but yeah. they're muscle spasms. Right. It's called the Irish grip at the time. It's the Irish grip. Uh -huh. And um, they would put this uh, electrode on my belt to uh, warn me that, you know, uh, my anxiety was going up. And I was not allowed to go in the woods by myself. I tore that thing off. I never wore it. <laughs> because the moment I went in the woods, I had no anxiety. Right. I, I was very calm because you are who you are out there. There's no, there's no facade out there. You don't have to pretend you're someone else out there. You are who you are out there. Well, well, and I learned that long ago, and I just wanted to be in the, in the woods more and more and more. Well, you know, talk about that a little bit. I mean, that's one of the things that really intrigued me about the book and about talking with you at the show and listening to your, uh, your talk at the show, uh, your presentation. But how the outdoors, uh, it, if, if we get people... And it doesn't matter who you are or what you're dealing with, but when you get in the outdoors, there's just something about nature. It's just, it's so calming. Uh, you know, when we get on the water, Nancy and I go, first thing I do when I get on the water, I, I, I grab my, we push off, and I get in the middle of the river, and I grab my paddle, and I stick it up in the air, and I just lean back and look up, and I, I, I'm recharging what I call recharging my solar panel, my internal, yeah. you know, and there's just something about the outdoors that there's, it just it makes it uh, makes you whole again. I, I, it's hard to put into words, but uh, you know, explain how that affected you. I think I think the most simplistic way to, to put it is every culture on this planet, whoever we are and whatever culture we're from, we're born from wilderness. Unless we're aliens put here many years ago, but let, let's just say that that didn't happen. Let's say we're all born from wilderness. And what happens is when you're you're brought back to the womb of where you were born, mm -hmm. you calm down because you are again who you are. Where in, in everyday life, you go to work, and it sucks. you you mm -hmm. got to deal with everything. you got to deal with the herd. you got to deal with, uh, you know, the predation. you got to deal with, um, um, you know, p people that are overpowering you. Um, nature doesn't overpower you. I mean, it's dangerous at times, and it'll, it'll right. wake you up and, and make you realize that, you know, you're, you're not, you're not uh, really all that important out there. Right. I think that's, that's good to be out there. But... I mean, if I had to look at my first aid kit and all the misadventures I've had, and I'm talking like like years and years and, and, and days and days and being out there, it was never nature that I was afraid of. It was all the things that happened in a bad way. It was hu human, 
human beings that mm-hmm. actually cause problems. I mean, there was a trip where I went on where someone was sick. We, we, we went to get the plane to fly us out. The guy that was flying us out was arrested for child pornography, so he couldn't get us out. Then finally someone else got us out, and then someone punctured our tires on the, on the back road, and so we were delayed two days. And everybody goes, well, why would you even go on that trip? I went, that had nothing to do with nature, guys. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it had nothing to do with actually a bear or bad weather or mosquitoes. And the other time was I was go- going uh, to give a presentation at a show about my wilderness trips, and there was an accident on the highway, and I administered first aid, and actually the guy died. It was not a good time. Went to the presentation, and someone in the audience said, isn't this wilderness travel dangerous? And I said, absolutely not. The highway is dangerous. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, and that's the thing. You know, like you said, when you do your when you do a day job and you, and you have all that, you do need something to to get away and and do your recharging and like you said at an early age for you with that high anxiety level that you were seeing as soon as you figured out where the as soon as you stepped into the woods and you felt that calm man that just you gravitated that probably so much so often it you were probably less at home than you you less and less at home and find you in the woods right yeah it's also like you think about skill set too if you've learned throughout your life to light a good fire, to get a tarp set up, to actually catch a brook trout, because I, well, why do I like brook trout? Because they're not easy to catch, mm-hmm. okay? Yes, I like bass fishing, but yeah, really, like everybody catch bass, okay? Right. So we catch a brook trout, um, uh, and, and far in the wilderness too, especially. So you feel proud of yourself. You, you don't conquer nature. That's nothing to do with that. You, you actually conquer, not conquer, but you, you, you're proud of your abilities, and you... you you, you progress on your abilities, and it makes you feel good about yourself. And making yourself feel good about yourself really does help with high anxiety, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's it's goal, kind of goal-driven. It is goal-driven. You know, it, it, you want to eat. You want to stay warm. Uh, you want a good place to sleep while you're out there. And, and those are daily goals to get you to whatever that time frame is or that end. Uh, and, and if you fail at making a fire, well, you're... You're gonna to have to eat sushi if you're if you catch fish, and if you don't catch fish, then at least you can warm yourself by the fire if you made a fire. Uh, but I, yeah, I understand it. It's it's kind of all goal driven. But then something you said before the show that interested me was, you know, it, I don't go in the out. Or you said this. I don't go into the outdoors to survive. I go out to thrive. And and you, that, you talked a lot about that in, in East Lansing when you gave your speech. Yeah, yeah, because I'm a happy camper. So. So I think it's cool to, to do uh, bushcrafting. In fact, I think bushcrafting is really great. I mean, you know, there's something call, I call fake bushcrafting. It's like you sort of like, you know, tear the woods apart and say right. you're bushcrafting. You're not, you're not bushcrafting. Um, so the bush skills, I think, is really kind of cool. And I did that growing up, and I still do. I, I still, you know, I, I take uh, students out, and they do a, a flint fire. In fact, they did that today in a pouring down rain. And, boy, Lord, to make them feel so good about themselves when they did that. That, right. that was incredible. Kevin, I can't do this. You do this. I went, no, I'm not going to do this. I've done it 10,000 times. I'm going to sit here and watch you do this. And it's called bush time. Mm-hmm. It's it's more and more time, more and more skill, okay? So we're going to sit here all day until you get that fire going. So to be a, a happy camper is like to thrive out there is I don't go out there uh, to say, I, look, I survived three days and ate gruel. No, I went for 10 days, had really good meals, had a good scotch, had a lot of fun with my friends, caught good fish. And at the end of the day, we didn't want to go home for a while. We, mm-hmm. we weren't rushing back to our cars to get home, right? So... That's why I can go on long trips. So you're, everybody goes, well, how can you go for a 20-day trip? Well, because if you do a three-day trip, you you think you're going to die the first night. And I would, too. My first night, I'm thinking, why am I out here? I have no friends. The bear's going to kill me. <laughs> By day five, you, you haven't died yet. So um, you're not really worried about the bear anymore because it hasn't killed you. And by 10, day 10, you really don't know it's day 10 because you don't really care if it's day 10. And by day and, 20, you don't want to go uh, back. Oh, well, yeah, and it, because it's become your routine lifestyle, mm-hmm. whereas back at home, you have a routine lifestyle. You get a coffee in the morning, you go on the highway, you go to work, you, you come home, have a beer, whatever. But out there, you wake up in the morning, have a coffee, go across the lake, go across the portage, set up camp, put the tent up, get the fire going. So it's become a routine, mm-hmm. and you're very comfortable, and you're, again, thriving, right? You're, you're not sur- surviving. and. When my daughter, when I, I've taken her out for years, right? And when she was like two years old, we'd be a, you know, on, a, on a 10 day trip and she'd be giggling in the tent at night. She's not afraid. That's her, mm-hmm. that's her lifestyle. Right. right. 
she doesn't yeah you taught her that you know there's there's no fear there because you showed her the, the correct way and and built that into her so you know that's just passing it on uh down uh i tell you what let's go ahead we'll take our, our second break we come back i've got a question i want to lead into uh about these longer trips and uh, we'll we'll take off from there so we're gonna step outside take our next break we'll be right back after this Okay. Um, Adam Wynn says we need more Canadians on the show. Yeah. Yeah. I should call my cousins up in Quebec. You know, Adam, uh, maybe you should go over to Canada and, and let him take you on a fishing trip. That, he is our resident fisherman here at Up North Journal. Uh, oh, that's right. That's well. That's well. We, I, you know, the other day on a, on a podcast, I defended you, you guys, and I was quite proud of it. Um, there was a, a podcast which one it was it was a Canadian podcast and they're talking about they're talking with the, the, the friends of Wabakimi so Wabakimi is a park we have here mm-hmm. and three of the four people on the friends of were Americans so more than one three of them said well why are they not Canadian it's a Canadian park and of course everybody gets all in a fluster and I said that's because 94% of the people that use that park are American and if it wasn't for those people we wouldn't have Quetico because actually Sigurd Olson met Eric Morris which is a Canadian Sigurd Olson was a famous American, mm-hmm. and they wanted to extend the park system. So he met them on the portage, created this si- system to extend it. So if it wasn't for the Americans, we wouldn't even have those parks. And, of course, everybody goes, oh, that's history. I went, yeah, history is important to know. It <laughs> is, you know, and, and, and looking back at history, you know, uh, Roosevelt, you know, talking about the national parks uh, in, in conservation, and I, I know you're heavily into that. We'll get into that here in a few minutes, but, uh, you know, North America, I, I think we, your country and our country has done such a great job at making these these parks for everybody to be able to use. You know, as long as we can protect them and save them and all that, uh, it's it's great to have. So hats yeah. off to hats off to both countries for doing that. You know, you guys. Yeah. Have I, think, awesome I think people places. have to get out uh, and travel more because if you go to other countries, they're so jealous of what we have. Absolutely, so absolutely yeah. right. So all right, you ready? Yep. Okay, here we go. Stand by. Three. Two and one. Welcome back. Third segment of the show. In uh, before we we went to break, you got something real quick. We're talking to Kevin Callen, and I just want to mention that if anybody wants to order the book "Another Bend in the River" by, by the the Happy Campers Memoir, uh, you can go over to uh, Amazon the books there, or you can go to the Happy Camper or KevinCallen.com, and you can scroll there. He's got a website. You can check it out. His road show. And uh, he's got another book there, uh, Once Around Algonquin, now available there. And if you if, if you like reading his book but you want to see more of a video, he's got the Casey Happy Camper channel over there on YouTube. So you can go check out some videos that he has over there. And actually, there is a video that he did from the Quiet Adventure Symposium. Okay. I did not know that. There you go. All right. So, well, Kevin, so we've been talking about, you know, how the outdoors recharges us, how, you know, you take these longer trips. One thing that really struck me that, that you said, and I can't remember if it was at the symposium or in the book, I think it was in the book, you talk about how important your campsite is, picking the right site. Um, can, you, can you go into that a little bit and why it's like, oh, there's a beach over there. Well, let's just go over there and set, you know, set up a tent. Talk about why you put so much thought into picking the right site on the water. Yeah, Sigurd also said the best with the exclamation marks of our, of our trip. Because um, you, you'll forget the portage. I mean, at the time you won't. You're like, I hate this one. <laughs> and uh, you'll forget the lake you cross. You might not forget the river you're on because that's more of a journey, whatever. But you will never, ever forget the, the perfect campsite you had on that lake. And the one, it, it, it's something you always want to go back to because it's your home. It becomes your home. You set up your tent, your campfire. It's become your place, mm-hmm. right? It's almost like the first time you bought a house. Or rented an apartment, right? Uh, it, it becomes your own, right? Or first time you bought a car, mm-hmm. right? I got the green Montego, <laughs> which, by the way, my my friend borrowed and actually messed around with a girl in the back seat <laughs> in my car before I was even. I never did that. Just That's not a right friend, there. man. <laughs> Come on. That's not. He's not a friend. You know what? I should, I befriended him after that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good stuff, but. Yeah, the, the, the sights, uh, you know, this, like you talk about seeing the stars or seeing a sunrise or watching a sunset. And, and, you know, those are the things I take pictures of, and they stick in my memory. They're vivid. Uh, so I, I get what you're saying about that. 
Yeah, and it's great memories coming home too. But at the same time too, I always I always laugh at this. I go, you know, you can you can look at a beautiful uh, sunset. You can actually uh, listen to the loons. But if a bear chased your buddy, that's the story you're coming home with, man. <laughs> yeah, right. It's that sense of adventure. Like mm-hmm. you know, maybe we live a mundane life at home, or or you know, maybe we don't, but we think we do. But you know, when a, a bear chases my buddy, I'm going to tell that story ten thousand times over. Like, right? you know, even if he died. <laughs> there you go. All I have to do is run faster than him. <laughs> That's right. Um, you know, you talked about picking out the perfect site. Um, are is taking an axe with you like taking a banana on a boat? Uh, uh, <laughs> but you know, the axe debate is a huge debate. Um, it is. You got all. You got a whole page on it here. That's where I. I know. I know. I, so, so uh, bear with me on this, and, and don't get up, get up suddenly. I'm going to talk by my experiences. In winter, I would never go without an axe. You need an axe to split the wood to get more wood, right? Mm-hmm. In the summer, you don't need an axe, especially a hatchet. You can take one as long as you're skilled with it. That's fine. But I guided. I got. I've guided a lot of youth too. Mm-hmm. And the day where the 14-year-old boy was squatting down with a hatchet, splitting wood, and yes, I did show him how to do it, and that's not how you do it. Hatchet to the groin, completely open. Mm-hmm. Had to get a helicopter to take him out. So after that, I said, I am not taking a hatchet uh, with these these youth. And then my boss would say, well, teach them proper. I did. He's 14. <laughs> he he messed listen. up. Because if he, if he cut himself with a bush saw, I can mend that with my first aid kit. A hatchet, I cannot do that. Uh, it, it's a it's an airlift out. Oof. Wow. So with that said, with that said, everybody else is right. If they said, well, he has to be skilled. I I, you, I agree. I just after that incident, I said, yeah, maybe not. <laughs> so that'd be probably one of the, the the most misused tools in the outdoors as far as people getting hurt with. I, oh, a, a, a hatchet especially because if you mess up, that, that's a nasty cut, mm-hmm. right? If it's um, a good hatchet, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and like again, like I, I use an axe all the time, whatever. But do you really need a, an axe in midsummer on a canoe trip? Mm-hmm. No, you don't. Um, and if you're bringing a bunch of Yahoo boys, yes, you should teach them how to use it, and that's the way we always did. But I don't know. Maybe I'm just getting older, wiser, or paranoid. Maybe paranoid. The older you, you, you get, and the more trips you take, do you find yourself wanting to be? alone on these trips by yourself or with maybe just uh, one or two people and then taking longer trips as time goes on? I've always been that. I've always liked solo trips, to be quite honest. They're easier to plan. You can do whatever you want. You can eat whatever you want. You can get up whenever you want. Uh, do I get lonely? No. Um, some people would. I always say that group dynamics is really important on a trip to get along with everybody, mm-hmm. especially when you're going solo. I mean, if you don't like yourself, then don't go on a solo trip. <laughs> but also, I, I do get finicky of who I go with, and it's always been that case, not because of me getting older. It's because of my jobs. So I spent a lot of time taking youth out. I take a lot. I, I, I guided for many years. So when I go with my buddies, they're my buddies. I don't want any strangers They're, they're I, because it's a holiday. And if I didn't go with them, it would not be a holiday. There you go. So I think that's just a personal thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. I know I get to about, if I go up north hunting, and, and typically during bow season, I'll take, a, uh, you know, two weekends in, the, in between week off, so I'm nine days. At about day five, six, I'm starting to go a little bit stir-crazy because I'm by myself, and I, that human interaction. And, and speaking of that, uh, that leads me into my next question, thinking about the show alone. And, and in your book, you talk about that you've had the opportunity They've asked twice to to come onto the show as, a, as one of the contestants. If people out there don't know what alone is, go look it up because I'll tell you what, it's really cool. But uh, you know, can you talk about a little bit about that? And I mean, we did before the show, and I understand now why. But uh, talk about why you didn't take that opportunity to go out into the wilderness to push yourself to an extreme for how many days? You know. Yeah. So it happened a couple of times. So the very first um, season, so nobody knew about the show at all. And I, I, I've done a few t- TV things in my life, whatever. So that's probably what, how they contacted me. But imagine this, not knowing anything about it. Um, but at the time, nobody knew this. But I, uh, my wife wanted a separation at the time, and things weren't good. And I did not want that to happen. And my my daughter was quite young, and I'm very connected to my daughter. 
And also I got this this call. It was actually a phone call from them and saying, you know, we want you to apply. Mm -hmm. And um, and I said, what is the show? So then I went to an uh, uh, an Asian person I knew. Um, the agent did a lot of film in Toronto and and Kip Kip Spidell, a really famous film producer. And he goes, Kevin, this is a big deal. Like this, it's from the History Channel. Like the, this is it. Mm -hmm. If you want to uh, make any type of li livelihood, because in the outdoor world, you don't make a lot of money, right? Right. Um, and he goes, you should do this. I went, okay. And he goes, could you do this? I went, right now? Yes, I could. Because actually right now, the way my life is going, I, I, they'd have to come and get me. <laughs> when the show's <laughs> over, they'd have to come and get me. Like, I would have no problem staying out there. Right. Um, but then my daughter found out about it, and again, really young, and she goes, Dad, please don't leave right now. And I, I said, no problem. But then I answered the show the second time when they asked me again. Of course, at that time, I, my daughter got, was older and she, she, was, she was, wasn't around as much. And I'm thinking, well, I could do this. Mm -hmm. But then I thought throughout my life, again, I'm, I, I'm the happy camper. I don't, I don't match the show. Right. So I did jokingly say to them, I'll be on your show if my items I could bring would be a camp chair, good food, good scotch. <laughs> A good sleeping bag, and they're they're they laughing. Well, that's not what the show's all about. And I went, well, maybe it should be because I'm not going to be a part of that. I I love the show. Just so you know, I love the show. Um, I watch the show all the time, and I I know a lot of the people that want it, and a lot of them are, are friends of mine, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm not knocking it. It's just not me. It never has been. Well, that's the whole point, right? You, you know, the 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 show. Those are specific types of people, and it's not everybody that can do that. You know, you know, you just, yeah, no, it's it's like, you know, like you just said, you're the happy camper. Bring me my camp chair, mm -hmm. you know, a good scotch. Uh, you just, yeah, I'll, I'll do that alone, right? It, it was comical, it, and they they laughed at it as well. I mean, they, they're kind of taken back at it first, but they, they laughed at it as well. I said, okay, and I go, because my entire life I've created this persona by accident as being the happy camper. Mm -hmm. Why would I go back and actually be completely opposite? Right. <laughs> yeah, be uh, totally out of character, right? So you you got to tell me a little bit about this. Uh, uh, we have a, a sponsor of ours, Deer Camp Coffee, but you explain in the book how to make real camp coffee. Yeah, that's really important to know. <laughs> Absolutely, it starts my day. I want to be informed, so inform me, sir. <laughs> So you can bring innocent, you can do percolated, whatever, but um, I wouldn't say it's the best coffee, but it's the most impressive coffee to make. And I learned this by guiding. Actually, uh, in fact, actually, a, a really famous uh, Canadian paddler, Hap Wilson, uh, taught me this years ago when he guided, and then when I got it after him in Tomogamy. So what you do is you boil water on, on, on the fire, and then you take the boiled water off the fire, and you put coffee grounds in, 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 in there. You never put it back on the boil, because tannic acids of coffee are released three degrees above boiling point, and the the uh, oils, uh, the flavorful oils of coffee, are released three degrees below boiling point. So if you let the coffee grounds sit, it releases a nice flavor. So if you were to put it back, it tastes like shoe leather, right? Mm -hmm. So, but the only problem with that is really good coffee, but all these floating grounds are floating around, right? So the best way to settle those grounds just is bang your knife on the side of the, the pot three times or four times, and they'll settle. But that's really boring, and you're guiding, and people are paying you <laughs> money to look impressive. So I would swirl the, the pot over my head like this and use centrifugal force to push the grounds to the bottom of the pot and tell everybody this. So this boiling water was swirled around my head, and then when they weren't looking, I would bang it three times on the side of the pot, right? And they're like, oh, this is great. Now, what was happening, too, at that time is there's always someone on the trip you don't like, but you don't really want to say, especially when you're guiding. So you give them the first pot, uh, first cup of coffee, and they, they think, oh, I didn't think you liked me, but I, I guess you are because you give me the first cup. Well, that's where all the grounds are floating. So that person's getting all the bad grounds, but they, they think you're doing this because you're liking you. And then you would give them the last uh, cup of coffee. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you very much, Kevin. Well, it's because all the grounds are floating around there as well. So not only are you really impressing everybody with your skills that really don't exist, it's all facade, you're actually getting back to the person you don't really like. I'm sure. Well, you, you also, the way you describe it in the book, it, it's also a, a, a workout because you're actually doing that. You could be doing that with the pot up and down while doing squats. Oh, the squat thing, yes. That's a, that's a, a UK thing. They do that in Wales and... 
I always thought they were get, getting me on by doing this. They're like squatting down, up and down. So they do the same thing instead of swirl around, they just squat, right? And that just looks silly, and but it works. It works. <laughs> so there you go. That's how you make a real camp coffee. And I'll never take the first cup from you, or the last. <laughs> Probably might be a good idea. Yeah, yeah. So thanks for the warning, Kevin, because now I know. <laughs> there you go. Right. <laughs> And so you know you, you 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 get out there. You like you said you've done you've done um, kayak or canoeing all over. And um, when when what was the worst weather you've ever encountered? Was it in the cold? Was it in the summer? Was it thunderstorms? Was it a tornado, typhoon, whatever? What was the worst? storm that you encountered while in your canoe yeah so right now i i would say in fact someone asked me this today when i was at the the grocery store they said what, what what's so the most dangerous thing out there and it is bad weather because it changes so dramatically now i mean look look at today boom like it's just major right and so i remember being in uh wabakimi we were with a film crew actually and we we're filming uh wendell beckwith's cabin um he was a hermit that lived up there american actually um and he believed Pi 3.14 uh, existed up there. And he built these cabins. And he was like, woo! Uh, and then he died. But we were out there filming. And so they were filming me out in the lake. And all of a sudden, the wind turned. And the sky turned green opposite to the wind. And that means hurricane winds. Those, those, those twister clouds are coming mm -hmm. in, right? And they're all hailing me to the shore because they're like, something's going to happen. So I go to the shore, and we go to make a bush camp to get out of it. And right then, we all had sandals on for some reason, and these um, red ants were biting our feet, and we're like, ow, 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 ow. So we moved to the next point, and then we made camp there. And then the storm hit, and was one of those, you know, those um, those winds that just take everything, everything down in a swath. Straight right? line winds. Yeah, so where we were originally was completely devastated. There was nothing left. The trees were completely toppled, everything. Where we had moved, um, we were fine. So if those red ants didn't bite our feet, we'd be dead. The ants saved his life. Wow. Right? Yeah. That, that's incredible. They might have knew something was up, too. Right. Um, but, so, yeah, you know, it, it's. It, I see that uh, you, you've done canoeing... Um, in the in being in the winter but you should be dressed properly yeah uh, winter camping uh, just don't don't go camping for your very first time in the winter but i love winter camping I, I love using a freight toboggan with a hot tent getting a wood stove going it's your mini cabin you're hauling uh, uh, behind you uh winter was always the the best time to to move up north when i traveled with the Cree and the Chibwe, they they it, winter time was when you moved in the bush and, and you trapped and hunted Whereas in the summertime, the bugs were too bad, right? Mm -hmm. So they taught me a lot about that. Uh, taught me a lot about, about being calm out there. Don't be in a hurry. Um, again, the happy camper. They, they taught me all about that. It's like, you know, why are you in a rush out here? So, um, yeah, I, I just love winter. And I, I think that it's, that's a true Canadian thing. If you live in Canada and you hate winter, why are you even here? <laughs> like, we have four seasons, and you're, you're lucky to have four seasons and not just one. Right, right. right. Yeah, that's kind of what you here in Michigan. You know, you wait five minutes and it changes. I mean, for yeah, sure. tru truthfully, you know, everybody says, oh, the winters that, you know, they are so hard. I'm like, you got three months of it. You know, enjoy it while it's here. And then, you know, we, we get out and we, we do a little snowshoeing and do some hiking. And, you know, we've even uh, kayaked in the snow, you know, uh, on the rivers here before they freeze up. So, you know, we try to make the most of what time we do have and, and play in it. I mean, you only go around once, right? That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Em embrace it instead of uh, trying to run away from it. Yeah, exactly. You know, you call yourself the happy camper. I, I kind of get that talking with you, and you're kind of pretty happy. Uh, I noticed your dad was known as the fighting shamrock as a boxer. And so the happy camper, did you come up with that, or did somebody look at you and go, you are the happy camper? No, that's a great story. First of all, my dad was, um, gosh, uh, kind of cool question about my dad. is like he was a professional boxer, and everybody in town knew him. I mean, after that, his boxing, he worked in a factory all his life, whatever. And I, we're quite proud of him doing that, raising a family and stuff. But everybody knew him, and, of course, I was that shy kid. Um, but then now I've become, like, you know, the, the, everybody knows me in town, right? 
So what happened though was I wrote a bunch of guidebooks, but it was this one book called Happy Camper. It was all to do with how to. It wasn't to go about where to go, and it became a massive bestseller in one month. Like a bestseller in Canada uh, is five thousand books in, in one year. It sold ten thousand in the first two weeks it came out. Wow. So the media loved me. I was on media all the time. And if you do a you know, backlog of Google and on YouTube, me being media. But I'll do this short story, but it's a classic story. And I can't make this story up. It was so classic. So I was on my very first morning show, right? And um, everybody, all my colleagues were all happy with me. And they're like, oh, Kevin, you, you've made it. You, you, you're you on the, the best, the biggest show in Canada this morning. Yeah. And we're going to talk about the book. Well, books are boring. So I had all these gadgets in front of me, camp gadgets. And one was a whiz easy. It's a device where women insert so they can pee standing up. And I had that on the table. And the male host comes up, and the female host loves camping, but the male host said, I don't like camping, let's just get this over with. I went, well, you're a bit of an ass. And, <laughs> and we're live across Canada. And so he picks up the first device, which is the whiz easy, and uh, he goes, Kevin, what's this? I go, it's a whistle, give it a try. <laughs> he puts this device in his mouth and starts blowing on it. And of course, the female host tells him what it is, and he spits it out. He's furious. With me. He's so furious. And the show's over, and I come home, and my colleagues are like, "Kevin, what are you doing this morning? Like, that is so wrong. Like, your your whole, your whole career is done. You had your chance. You had your chance, but it's all done." I'm like, well, he didn't like camping. He deserved what he got. There That's all go. I'm saying. And the next morning, I got all these phone calls, and I I did endless shows the next day because they're like, "Kevin, you're really funny. Can we have you on?" <laughs> And I was making lots of money and selling a lot more books because of that guy. Right? Because thanks, thanks to him not liking camping. Because <laughs> you are the happy camper. And, and he wanted to try the whistle. <laughs> you know? And, yeah, if you look all the, uh, at all those morning shows and all the CBC radio stuff I've done, that's what my name is called, The Happy Camper. That, that's where it started because of that book. That's, that's great. That is yeah. awesome. Well, that's what it is. And I just I found that picture of his dad and the, the fighting shamrock. And I'm like, mm -hmm. all right, so... And, and by the way, the younger picture, he does look like you and vice versa. So, right. you know, did, did, are you, is your family originally from Canada? Yeah, it's funny you would talk about that too. So my, my dad was Irish, my mom's Scottish, and my dad's passed away, my mom's still, still around. And um, so my dad was always saying, you're Irish, you're Irish, because I was the last Irish male, Callan, right? Didn't know much about my, my um, Scottish uh, background, because that was my mom's, about, uh, probably 10, 12 years ago, I went to Scotland for the first time with my daughter. Well, actually, more than that. She was only five. Anyway, went there and met my Scottish um, cousins, and they looked like me. They had the same birthmarks as me, and they're all writers. I didn't know this. You know the the story of Bobby where the dog w w wouldn't leave the grave in right. Scotland? Right. Well, my great-grandfather did made the statue and the poem of that. Oh, wow. I didn't know that until I went to Scotland. And then my, the woman that picked me up, she's my cousin, and she's the the uh, chief edi uh, editor of the Edinburgh Times. Um, my grandfather w w was a writer, um, and I didn't know that until I went to Scotland because, again, it was the, the Irish thing that was more important. And then I've gone to Scotland, i got to say, more than Ireland because I've got to know all my cousins there. But it was kind of cool to, to see that, it, you know, the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. Right? Wow, so. yeah, yeah. I mean, just uh, to, to be a writer and then to find out that the rest of the family are writers too. That, that's incredible. Yeah, yeah. That's and and cool. I'm, not a, I'm, I'm not a boxer. Like, I mean, I love my dad and I'm proud of what he was, but you look at me like, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> right? So I tell you what, we're coming up on our last break. When we come back, we get to turn the tables on you and ask you some questions that we want to ask all our newbie interviewers. All right. So we're going to step outside, take our last break, and we'll be right back after this. We'll take it easy on you. It's, it's nothing too intrusive. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's a lot of fun so uh, i do i do like the black fly story because my my family uh ruan naranda quebec uh we'd go up there every summer and literally those black flies were oh terrible. that was terrible Oof. you still got family in quebec yeah. oh yeah oh yeah okay i think we forget about how bad the bugs are right right now because we're not, we don't deal with them until right yeah. till till you wait from now. <laughs> yeah. You wait till we be reminded for sure. Right? So. Oh I can't send deer flies. Deer flies drive me insane. Oh, uh, we get them. Don't worry. You don't have to send. Don't send them anymore. They're bad enough here. <laughs> no, no kidding. All right. Here we go. Stand by. Three, two, one. 
Welcome back. Last segment of the show. Man, the show's flying by. It tonight. is flying by, and if, you, if you're flying by and you're, you're, you're wondering why we're talking to the happy camper, is one reason is Another Bend in the River by the happy campers, his memoirs by Kevin Callan. So you got to get this book, folks. Get it. He's got 19 other books that you can read about. Uh, you can go to his website at kevincallan.com. You can order it over there or go to Amazon as well. He's also got a video side uh, on YouTube, uh, the Happy Camper, Casey Happy Camper. Um, so go over there, check that out, get some videos over there. Like we talked about, uh, there's actually a video from when Mike met him over at the Quiet Adventure Symposium. So, All right, so last segment. Uh, we want to save the, the questions here. Yeah, 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 no, we got, we got, we, you know, we, we looked at, uh, the one thing we didn't ask you is for the simplest in terms of somebody, we, we, we talked, Mike, we've talked before about buying a kayak, but when you buy a canoe, what, what are some of the things you should be thinking about before you run out and, and, and buy one? What, you know, what, what's the, the kind of the checklist? Yeah, it's not that easy because there's so many different designs and stuff. I think the one thing that everybody should know that, that a lot of people don't know is, like, I, pr I prefer the Prospector model. And the reason why I like the Prospector is that Prospectors used it because it's not fantastic for anything, but it's good with everything. So you can actually solo pellet by si sitting in the, in the, in the, in the uh, bow canoe and pointing it the other way because it's symmetrical. Whereas stream uh, uh, um, asymmetrical boats are faster in the water but you can't do them solo, so you need two boats, one mm. solo and the other. And the other is that it's got good payload, it's, it's good in, in big water, and that sort of thing. It's okay in rapids. But here's what really you should know about. There's a whole bunch of companies out there that sell a prospector. Well, they all came from the original prospector, but they cannot have the original prospector because when a company actually makes their own prospector, they have to change it to make it their own. So, uh, so when someone says, well, this is a prospector canoe, mm -hmm. well, look into what, what the design is. And I won't go into certain companies, but I do, I do know some companies have a poor prospector with a low payload, low to the water, and others are far better. And yet the, the companies will say, no, no, this is a prospector. Well, no, it's not the original chestnut design, uh, or, you know, that, that sort of thing. Also, what can you afford? Should you maybe rent for a few years? Because mm -hmm. they're a lot, they're really expensive. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing about uh, people that will tell you, well, it has to have three keels or at least one keel. That's old time. Like the keels were always put in a canoe to keep things straight, right? Especially a three keel canoe, which mm -hmm. my my first canoe had three keels. But now, if they're streamlined uh, and pointy, that is the keel. You don't need a keel in the boat anymore. And yes. Um, you know, traditional people will argue with me about that, but that's fantastic. Go in your three keeled or your keeled canoe. I, I have two of them in my backyard. I have 12 boats, right? I caught them all. I'm a fanatic. <laughs> but in the new boats now, you really don't need a keel if it if it's designed to be streamlined. Um, the other is what's called tumble home. Tumble home is when the boat is kind of shaped like like this, and it, it's it's really important to know what's uh, initial stability and second stability. So if you go out in a, in a boat and you feel really comfortable and stable in the boat when you first go out, it's not a good canoe. Uh, it might feel like a good canoe, but if you get in really bad water, that water is going to come in. But if you're in a in a boat that has second stability, you're like, oh, this feels really tippy. It's really tippy. That's because it has good tumble home and also has a, a, a homemade keel into the boat. So when you start going, you're very stable. So it's called it second stability, and then you'll go you'll go a lot quicker than uh, than if you're in initial stability. You feel better one. Here's a good example: sports bell. You guys know sports bell kids, mm -hmm. right? They're great boats. I'm not knocking them. Uh, uh, and you feel great when you, you go in them. You get in rough water. That thing's not, not a good boat to be in. <laughs> right. However, I got to say, if you can afford one, I would use a sports bell. There's nothing wrong with them. Well, looking at it, the type of canoe. Paddle wise, I, and I know there's different shapes, there's different lengths, there's different uh, shaft bent straight. I mean, there's just all kinds. So if somebody is getting their first boat or their first canoe, where do you start with a paddle? Yeah, it all depends what you want to do. Like the, in your area, you've got bent shaft paddles. 
where I am, we don't generally use a uh, bench shop. We use uh, what's called beaver tail, or in, when I'm doing solo, we do an extended otter tail. Bench shop is a good blade if you're in a hurry. It pushes a lot more water, um, whereas the straight shop it isn't. It's more finesse. Mm -hmm. uh, I know if you go to the boundary waters, there's more there's more water than portages, so bench shop makes more sense in in a golf when you're portaging more and doing small creeks. So that. But it doesn't really matter about that. I think what's really important is you, you know about how a blade works. If you go to an outdoor sh uh, store and they have a bin of blades, so whatever, it's a bench shop or a, a straight shop, and it's a wide blade and it's on sale, you got to realize that, yes, that will push a lot of wa surface water, and it will, it, that, it, that's great. If I'm doing white water, I, I'll want that blade because I want to push a lot of water really quickly to get around the rock, right? Mm -hmm. But if I'm paddling all day, and I'm pu pushing surface water, I don't want that. I want a beaver tail, which is a, basically the blade is more in the water. And so that what it's doing is pushing the water under the surface and less friction on your wrists and your arms. So if you see those blades and they're on sale, that's why they're on sale. You, you nobody's don't buying them. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right? They, they want to get rid of them because nobody's buying them because when you use them, it's pretty tough. Yeah, um, yeah. You... you we talked about canoes. Have you ever made your own canoe? I tried. <laughs> uh oh. <I> tried. <laughs> the um, Bear Mountain Boats actually. Um, there, there's a company that actually is well known across North America for making boats. He was my neighbor, and I, I was in my backyard trying to fix this old Peterborough canoe, and yeah, he would just he would do the the Wilson over the fence and just shake his head. <laughs> Uh, yeah, it's still there. It's not fin finished yet. Okay. Oh, it's a work in progress, is what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, speaking of, of different types of canoes, different types of paddles, obviously, I mean, I know the answer to this, but I want to get it out there. Um, where would one go to, like, see maybe the history of, of canoes or see the history of, of different types of canoes? There, There is, like, a, a museum, right? Yeah, just like literally 12 minutes down the road for me. So the, the Peterborough Canoe Museum, uh, so that that was probably, it's about an hour and a half north of Toronto. And that is the place. It's the, uh, the history of the modern day canoe. And they now got a new uh, property and it's going to be opened up in August, which is literally down the road from where they were. But they're going to be on the water now. Okay. So they have a brand new museum that's going to be opened up in uh, mid-August. And um, I got to say, uh, you know, it, it's, it's one of those things. If I lived in Niagara Falls, I probably would not promote Niagara Falls. It's like, why would you go there? Blah, blah, blah. But I got to say, I live right beside the Canoe Museum. You need to go to the Canoe Museum. That's cool. So, yeah, yeah it's phenomenal. I know a lot of Americans, uh, they, they do that. They actually go to the Canoe Museum, and then they go canoeing afterwards. Because you think about where I'm from, you've got the Court of the Highlands, which is, like, right up the road. It, it, it's a park that you can go in. But just like uh, 40 minutes from me, you got Algonquin. Another hour, you got Killarney. Another hour and a half, you got Tomogamy. And we got so many places to pal around here and wild places, like the incredible places to go. So, a good holiday for you to do this mm -hmm. year is when the museum opens uh, up in mid August, go and visit the museum or do a canoe trip and then visit the museum. And yeah, make a trip. Up. Right. You, for everybody that's listening to the show, uh, just check the website. They are closed now. And they're not preparing to open up to late summer, early fall of 2023, it says on their website. Yeah, it's one of those typical things. They say it's going to be open in mid-August, and everybody's all excited about it. But, yeah, check the website, because you never know there right. when things are going to happen, right? So. Well, speaking speaking of uh, the area up there where you're, you talk about all the water and everything, uh, and, and the wilderness. And I know it's near and dear to your heart, but uh, you're, you're heavily into, like, the... Uh, the conservation side uh, and preserving things so people can enjoy it. Talk a little bit about that and how involved you are with that. Yeah, um, well, it's uh, it, it all started with um, uh, um, w when I started off. I, I, I thought, you know, I'm really hyper, so I got to choose one thing. Um, and uh, the founder of the a canoe museum, Kirk Whipper, uh, years ago, and he's deceased now, whatever, but years ago, he would go to some of my shows, and he goes, you know, Kevin, love what you're doing, but you're so hyper. You need to focus, right? Squirrel, right? <laughs> um, and I went, well, what do I, what do I need to do? And he goes, well, choose something. 
But he goes, if I were you, I would choose that your job is to get everybody out there. And so that's why I started writing guidebooks. To be quite honest, that's how the whole guidebook started. And I said, okay, why am I doing that? And he goes, well, people don't go out there. They don't reconnect out there. They don't realize what we have and what we always have had. And they, um, they don't realize why it should be protected. So if they don't go out there, they'll, you just kiss it goodbye. There's no reason for them to protect it if they have no connection to it. Right. It's like, why, uh, you know, why be in love with your wife if, it, if, you, if you don't know your wife? Right. Right. Or your not your wife, but your 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 partner. Mm-hmm. Doesn't matter. Really. Right. Um. But I don't know why I said that. It's not in my head. But <laughs> but um the but the whole thing about that is like this. So I I started writing guidebooks, and then people started, you know, saying, "Well, that's great." But other people started cursing me. I was called a wilderness pornographer because I was going out there telling everybody about this wild area, and then everybody was going there, and they're like, "Well, great, Kevin, you just told everybody my secret spot." I went, "There's a." Fin- you know, there's a difference between that. I'm not going to ever tell anybody about my secret trout spot. Never would I ever, ever tell anybody about my, my secret trout stream. Never. It took way too many years to find that stream, so I'm n- never going to tell anybody. If they're ever going to find it, they have to do the same work I did to get to it. Mm-hmm. But a golf park, is that a secret? No, it's not. Is Tamagi a secret? Is Boundary Waters a secret? Is Quetico a secret? No, it's not a secret. It's a, it's on the roadmap, for heaven's sakes. Right. So I have rules uh, and regulations and ethics of what I, I've done. So, um, yeah, and that's my whole thing is I, I wanted to get out there. And then later on, my writing became more of the etiquettes of being out there, the stories of being out there, and all that other stuff. Yeah, that's... Uh... We, we, we run into a lot of that here, especially uh, what we call state land. Uh, yeah. It's owned by the state of Michigan, but it's public land for everybody to use. And it's like, you're in my hunting spot, or, or like you said, my, my fishing spot. You know, my fi- my fishing spot, go-to spots on Lake, I'm, I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> it's old right. ancient Indian. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, you, so we have crown land. So what you guys have, too, we have crown land. And yeah. right now, it's, during the pandemic, the parks were so busy that people want to know where crown land was. And that's a tough one because I'm never going to just bring someone to my secret trout spot. No, I have to work for it to you, find it. Yeah, that's what makes it so so enjoyable and, and so rewarding is because you've put the effort into finding whatever that spot is, whether it's hunting, fishing, trapping, camping, whatever. You know, it's uh, I understand right. it. exactly. Oh yeah, no, yeah. I, I had a guy this spring. I was on uh, the, the one dirt road I know up here and I had my blue canoe and I guess everybody knows my blue canoe and I, I have a blue canoe because Tom Thompson said you know the lake trail won't see it if you troll over it right Right. but uh, <laughs> so um, but he was following me on the road and I finally stopped and, and I was like hey can I help you you're lost he goes no just following where you're going Kevin I went so you know who I am you know where I'm going mm-hmm. and you're going to follow me to this spot and it took me seven trips to find this lake like for over five years, and then you're just gonna follow my my well, truck. It's easy that way. It's the easy yeah. button. It's the easy button, right? Yeah. Yeah, and you know my answer to him. I go, well, do you want me to put the fish on your lure when you get there as well? Or there what? you go. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'll give you the color, the pattern, and everything. You know. Better yet, I'll catch him for you, and then I'll just hand him to you. Yeah. You can just sit yeah. in the truck. <laughs> well, you know, it'll be like a drive-through. I'll walk up, hand you the fish, you can just leave. It is a fine line. I also have people that will say, well, Kevin, you know, I, I, I want to drive uh, two hours from the city. I don't want to portage. I want to catch lots of fish. I don't want to see anybody. What canoe route would you suggest? I went, well, actually, that doesn't exist. And if it did, I wouldn't tell you. About <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. Totally get that. Yeah. So, but, you know, this book is, I, I've, I've started looking in more and more in, in this book after Mike got a hold of it and he told me about you and, uh, people got to get this book, Another Bend in the River, by the, the Happy Campers Memoirs. And literally, you will be, uh, the, the, what little I've started to read, I've been kind of cracking up, uh, especially starting off with the Catholic boy and seeing where he's at today. It's well, awesome. Reading through this, there's different things in here, you know, that, that reminded me how I got my start in the outdoors as, as a youngster with my dad. Uh, you, you know, yours was fishing, you know, mine was hunting with my dad, and it's just, it, there's lots of things in there that are very similar, and it's uh, it's a good read. I'm telling you, if anybody is looking for something to read, whether it be on vacation at home or on a trip or what have you, even in the deer blind or at fish camp, pick it up. I'm telling you, you won't regret it. Yep. So. Okay, so the, 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 the whole hunting thing, would you, there's a shot of me with my first uh, partridge 
in there, and it's such a geeky shot, right? Yep. But I, never, I didn't put the story in. My, my mom said the other day I should have. Um, my first uh, uh, cottontail rabbit I shot, and it was, I, I, had a, I had a shotgun called the blunderbuss, because when you shot it, the shell wouldn't eject, so I had to go put a stick down it to get the shell out. And it was uh, it was on sale. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> and so I went out. My dad was all excited. I was going out for the first time to, to, to hunt a rabbit. And I, I shot the rabbit, and it, it died right beside me. Uh, I took it home, and he was helping me clean it, showed me how to clean it. And he goes, where did you shoot this thing? I went, well, it was pretty close, Dad. It was pretty close when I shot it. He goes, well, was it? there's no. And he goes, you shot and missed, and he gave it a heart attack. That's how it died. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <laughs> That's awesome. Oh, that way you, you didn't ruin any meat, though. Yeah, that. Well, I even said that. I go, no, it's a professional shot. That's I, right. I meant that. To happen. That's right. Right. <laughs> exactly. So, maybe next time we can try that at, at East Lansing with the Rabbit uh, Expo next door. Moose oh, don't put that in my head. That'd be hilarious. <laughs> oh. oh, well, I tell you, well, you guys get one phone call from yeah, jail. Yeah, so. there you go. Yeah, we don't want to do that there. So. Um, we come to the point in the show where we've got a few questions, uh, just fun questions we like to ask all the people who are on first time on the show. So, Danny, I'm going to let you do the honors. All right, newbie interviewee. Um, obviously, you've traveled around. It, I think you're finishing up so, snow, uh, show season, and you do a lot of traveling. We have, we've seen the videos on YouTube. Um, so as you're traveling, what are you listening to on the radio what's your go-to listening to when traveling all over uh, that's crazy but it's either a podcast or john denver good choice john denver right I, you know it, it's funny you mentioned that because the first time i went to the rockies the only time i've been to the rockies i finally understood what he, he was singing about with rocky mountain high it, it's it's simply incredible it's it was spiritual almost so i, I grew up listening to him and my my daughter reminded me the other day, so she's 18 going on 19, she's at university, and she calls me up at midnight, because I think something is wrong, I said, are you okay, and she goes, Dad, you know, it's exam time, whatever, and I've been listening to John Denver all week, hmm. why, I went, well, you high or something, what's going on, <laughs> <laughs> and she goes, oh, no, 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 I went, okay, and I go, well, I, when you're a baby, I used to soothe you by listening to John Denver, and I think that's clicking in right now, yeah. right, uh, you know. It's a it's a it's a calm, right? So yeah, yeah. Okay, so you're you're listening to John Denver, you're moving along the highway or you're heading up gonna go canoeing somewhere. What is your go to snack that you have in the vehicle? Oh grilled cheese sandwich. I like it. Like yeah. cold. Like 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 just in a in a in a paper bag. I just yeah, that's kinda weird. Yeah, but you, you know why my dad always had a cheese which because you're never going to get food poisoning if you have that kind of true there you go see look at yeah. that smart man interesting worst thing ever is get food poisoning when you're on a road trip and and you're doing presentations on the stage you don't want to throw up or poop no no, not not good. Good. no you don't food, not good um, <laughs> all right so mike and dan have made the trip up to your home there and you're going to cook us a meal that you said you guys have got it to have this now it can't be trout because i know that's in the book so we're not going to let you use that recipe but what would be the go-to meal that you would cook mike and dan when we we're at your place i would get a lake trout and then get walleye fillets put it inside the lake trout put onion uh lemon garlic and then sew up the lake trout and then in the backyard i'd bake it um and that's what we'd have Man, you know, th we got to get a new question because every time we ask this question, I wind up hungry. I know, right? And then I go, I, I go through the kitchen and try to find something after the show. Okay, got <laughs> two more questions left. Uh, th I'm throwing this one in because we've discussed it. We're gonna sit around the campfire. We're gonna, you, we're gonna, we're gonna have a, a beverage. I was gonna ask that question, man. That's weird. Oh, right. Great so, nice thing to like. All right, give me your best whiskey that you would say. This is the one. I would. That, that's a tough one because I actually collect whis whiskey, but Belvini twelve-year-old wood. And why is because I had an amazing job. I got paid for this. I went down to River Spey in Scotland, 
uh, with amazing paddlers, uh, world renowned paddlers, and we stopped at distilleries along the way and do it, did a taste testing. And of all the distilleries who I got to know, not only did I like their whiskey, but they were very ethical people, the Belvini. And because uh, it's true Scottish whiskey, because there's a lot of things going on with the whole distilleries now, and they're, they're, they're keeping to the, to the roots, right? Um, so that's pretty good. And I got to say, I got to tell you guys this story because I think a lot of your listeners would love the story. So when when I finished that that trip, that company came into our campsite for the last night and they did a big whiskey uh, demo with from Moonshine to actually uh, one whiskey that was 29 years old. It was amazing. So they gave me a bottle of whiskey of their 29 year old um, recipe. It was a thousand dollar bottle. They actually gave it to me. They 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 actually liked me. Kevin, we like you. Here's the bottle. I got home. Could you guys imagine, okay, you, 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 well, imagine bringing home a $1,000 bottle of bourbon, right, right, and then your friends find out, right, your friends find out, so they all come over, so my neighbor, Tim, uh, uh, lives right beside me, great guy, great neighbor, he's just that one of those guys, he looks like the uh, trailer park boys, with, you know, the whiskey and coke, right, <laughs> and so he comes over, and he goes, what's going on, guys, what's going on, <laughs> and my buddies tell him what's going on, I went, don't tell him what we're doing. <laughs> It's a thousand dollar bottle of whiskey, and so uh, I start serving everybody. And I, I don't think I don't believe I've been telling this story because it was always a secret for years. But what happened was I went to go and, and um, make him a drink, but I got, um, uh, it, I think it was Grant's. It was the, one of the cheapest, uh, <laughs> lightest scotches you could ever get, right? And I poured it and I gave it to him. To this day, he tells everybody, oh, "I remember when I was at Kevin's and we had that really fancy scotch." No. <laughs> I did, but you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh! Oh, that man. see that, that is that was evil. Terrible. I thought about it now. That's that, priceless. Absolutely. And the last question is: oh. that was a great story, but <laughs> you're gonna tell us a story around the campfire that you're gonna say it, it, it comes to your mind uh, that it, it hits you for whatever reason, and it's the story you're gonna go to and tell Mike and Dan because it moves you so much. Oh, wow. Yeah, my, uh, there's so many. Uh, but the one I, I would say is my daughter, she was eight years old at the time. We're doing a canoe trip across the Gawkwind for 12 days, right? And, and and it was day seven, and we're on the portage. She, she had a T-shirt on, tie-dye T-shirt, blue jeans, shorts, whatever. And we meet these guys, and this is where I'm talking about, about bushcraft. Like, I, I, I think bushcraft is phenomenal. But well, there was these guys that I would say big bushcraft. They had full military fatigues on, but they weren't military. They had big Bowie knives down to their their, their knees, right? And they meet her on the portage, and they're like, "How long are you out for, little girl?" And she goes, "I don't know. I don't know what day it is. Like, how long are you out for?" We're gonna go and we're gonna survive for two nights <laughs> in a Gawkin Park. <laughs> and she had already been out whatever days, and she didn't know what day it was. And she was eight years old, and she goes. Guys, I suggest you get out longer. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. See? That, that's awesome. And you know what? I know, well, Mike and I know these types that they need to be in full outdoor gear because they're going to be outdoors and, you know, they're going to take on the world. And, and sometimes we see that and we're just at the uh, sporting goods store. Yeah. Or, or you're at an archery shoot and everybody's in full camo. And it's like, well... I just don't understand. I, just, I they got to act the part, I guess. I don't know. Right. So, but yeah, those are the yeah. questions we like to yeah. ask our interviewees, and the great, great answers. I like the cheese sandwich. Yeah. Well, I, I got one last question, and then we'll wrap up the show. All right. A body of water you have not yet been on that you want to put a boat in. Yeah, I, I, I'm thinking that now because I'm going to be 60 this fall. So my buddy and I were going to turn 60, and we're like. Where do we go? And we, we have this hit list, right? Mm -hmm. So um, the one, I've been to the top of it, but not the whole thing. I want to circumnavigate Lake Nipigon mm. in, in a canoe or a kayak. Um, and I've been to the top because I went down the Kafka River from Wapakimi, and we got to the north shore of uh, Lake Nipigon, and we spent there a, a, for a few days. But I saw this, this mini Great Lake, uh, inland Great Lake, and it was phenomenal. Like I, I just want to go back, and it was just pelicans and bald eagles and nobody else. Um, it's just it's just rough water and really high cliffs all the way around. 
It would take about 10 days to circumnavigate it, but man, that's on my hit list. Yeah. It's a true wilderness. Yeah, it really is. Uh, and very skill set. You, you, you can't mess up out there. So It's, uh, you know, Canada, uh, United States, especially here around Michigan, Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, up in the New York and in, in that area. There's just so many great lakes. I mean, we, we are so blessed to have so much fresh water to go play in. It's amazing. Yeah, really, really. The, the one place I like to do uh, in your area, the Green River, it's, it's called Green River, right? Green River. In Michigan? Uh, uh, no, not Michigan. Um, I actually have, I've paddled a lot in Michigan. Osaba River? Yes. Uh, I've done that many times, actually. The Holy Waters. That, that by far, the south branch of the Osaba is, is my favorite place to put a uh, kayak in. Yeah, that, I, I love that. Uh, I, I, for many years, I've, I've done that when I've visited. Uh, but the Green River in the western U.S., um, the green. I don't know much about it. Uh, Cliff Chagason has always told me about it, uh, saying I should go. Uh, by Salt Lake City, Utah? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. And also, the one that goes into the Mexican border, too, he kept, I, I forget the name of the river, but he, uh, it's the Big Canyon. Um, Grand Canyon? You know, not the Grand Canyon, but one, one of those around there. Okay. Um, oh, shoot. Now you guys have to school me, because I can't remember all these places that you have. Is it, um, is it on the border, the border river, the Rio Grande? Yeah, Rio really Grande. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. So uh, he says it's not as dangerous as everybody says. Um, Stay on the U.S. Uh, side. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's true. The one thing I would always like to do with Cliff Jacobson is, uh, and I, I got to make sure it happens, um, is that uh, we've never canoed together. We've always gone done shows together and conversed mm -hmm. and debated, whatever. But I would love to go down Basswood Lake in the Boundary Waters uh, with him in a canoe and have the American flag on on one side of the canoe embedded and the Canadian uh, embedded on the other side. And then him paddling down, him and I paddling down the lake. And then at, at the portage, there's a campsite there with the with the border marker that that um, uh, Leopold actually camped at. And I want to sit there uh, with camp chairs and a campfire and debate back and forth. <laughs> there you go. Cool. That would be awesome. That would be awesome. You know, it's just something so simple. It's I'm telling you, if anybody's listening to this show right now and you've not experienced being on the water. In a, in a canoe or a kayak, uh, you, you got to do it. You just, you got to do it. It's, it's so invigorating. It, it's, like I said earlier, it's just, it recharges your soul. Right. It's, uh, I don't know, I can't get enough of it. I really can't, so, but. Uh, it is a simplistic lifestyle. You you go from A to B with the, all your belongings in a vessel. Yeah. And that's why we like it. it it's just very simple. Yeah, you and leave like, everything well, behind. You know? Yeah, and what we said at the very beginning, you are who you are out there. There's no facade about your character. Absolutely. Well, Kevin, I, I really appreciate you taking uh, uh, some of your time out tonight to be able to sit and talk with us. Uh, and like we, we talked about the book, make sure another bender in the river, get out and get this, and uh, take a look at some of his other bodies of work as well. Um, anything else, Dan? Nope. I think we've covered it from uh, stem to stern. There you go. I like it. All right. I tell you what, everybody, if you're listening to the podcast on iTunes, make sure you go over and give us a review. That helps people who support us. If uh, those of you who are watching the, the live stream here, uh, go over to Kevin's social media sites. Make, give him a like, follow, share, and uh, subscribe to his YouTube pages. And do the same for us, if you would, as well. And share the show. It's, uh, it helps the people who, in turn, support us. Uh, next week, do we have anything lined up? Uh, we just got to get a confirmation, but the flying angler. The flying angler. There you go. Interesting story. Very and very uh, beneficial to the ice fishermen here in <laughs> Saginaw right? Bay. For sure. For sure, especially the last couple of years. So, uh, if we can get him on next week, that's who's going to be our guest. So make sure you tune in next Wednesday night, 7:30, right here on Facebook, and uh, hopefully we will have that confirmation and we will have the flying angler on. Kevin, thanks once again, and uh, that'll do it for us this week, folks. Y'all take care, and we'll see you again next week. Thanks. Cheers, guys. <laughs>